Um, you know, we've been walking each Sunday as a church through the book of uh, First, or excuse me, through the book of Colossians, um, and it's been a uh, uh, almost a burdensome type of thing for me. I don't know if you've been able to to sense it, and the burden for me has been. Uh, essentially this, the message of the book of Colossians is incredibly powerful. It's incredibly uplifting. It, it shows us that Christ is sufficient for all of our needs, and even more than sufficient. He overflows uh, into our lives. He overflows from our lives into the lives of others. And uh, the, the burden for me has simply been one where I'm, I'm concerned that God's people um, are so easily distracted by the enemy's tactics and in such a way that they might seek to find spiritual sufficiency elsewhere other than Christ. Now, you know, Satan or his uh, uh, demons don't come into your life and basically say, hey, why don't you renounce Christ? You know, it's, it's not that obvious. Uh, the way it usually works is that uh, you will have different opportunities, if you want to call it that, to hear a message that would simply distract you from Christ. There are so many voices out there on social media, so many voices through mainstream media, so many voices at work and at school and everywhere else that uh, basically say to you, hey, look at this over here. Look at that over there. You know, squirrel. You know. and so we're easily distracted. We looked at everything under the world. And, you know, everything under the sun. So we, um, we just, we find ourselves listening to everything. And what we're, what we're in danger of is that we take our focus off of Christ. And that's, the, that's been the burden uh, for me to try to compete, if you will, with all the, all the voices in society that might seek to harm you. And, uh, you know, I don't want that for you. Uh, Christ has uh, shown that he is sufficient. And, in fact, the Apostle Paul in the first chapter of Colossians shows that Christ is sufficient. Uh, we've discovered in the past two weeks, we've taken a very slow journey the past two weeks, uh, covering only verses uh, 15 through 20 of, of chapter 1. And in these verses, Paul explains by using an ancient Christian hymn, that Christians sang at the first century, and he put this hymn into Scripture in, in these verses, verses 15 through 20. And I would have loved to have known, of course they would have been speaking Greek, but I would have loved to have known uh, how uh, these Greek-speaking Christians would have sung this hymn in Colossians 1. We don't have that, that tune, if you will. Um, but in Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20, we learn so many incredible, wonderful, beautiful things about how Christ is sufficient. Because we discover that this, this Christ that we've placed our faith in, he is, he is the one who is the revealer to you of the invisible God. He is the one who is the supreme ruler over all of creation, which includes you. We discover that this Christ that we placed our faith in is the creator of all physical and spiritual things, including you. That he is the creative agent of God the Father. God the Father used Christ to create you. We discover that Christ is the recipient of of all created things, it, all of it is made for him, including you. We discover that Christ is the eternal one. He's the pre-existent one who made you. We discover that Christ is the sustainer of all things, including your life. We discover that Christ is the head of the church, which includes, of course, you. We discover that Christ is the firstborn over all creation. He is the firstborn over the resurrection which you one day will enjoy. We discover that Christ is first place 
over all things, including you. We discover that all of the fullness of God dwells in Christ, making Him the one alone who you can trust. We discover that Christ is the reconciler of all things. And we're going to look at that idea more carefully today. He's the reconciler of all things, including you. We discover that Christ is the peacemaker for all things, including you. And we discover that Christ has sacrificed his blood on the cross, and he did it for you. And so this idea that we just mentioned a moment ago, Christ as the reconciler, is uh, explained a little bit further in the next few verses, verses 21 through 23. Because up to this point, in verses 15 through 20, what we're looking at is the person of Christ and the work of Christ. And now in verse 21, we discover what Christ's work on the cross did for you. So I would invite you to take your Bible, if you have access to a Bible, and turn to Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. We'll read through verse 23. I'll read aloud. I invite you to stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. The words will appear on the screen behind me. What we have in these verses, again, is an explanation of what Jesus did for you on the cross. And the Apostle Paul writes that once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. Father in heaven, I pray that you would illumine our minds so that we would understand your word and apply it to our lives easily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, a lot of people over the centuries have struggled pretty mightily trying to determine what in the world this cross that happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on it, what it has to do with us today. And it's a, it's a very good question. It's a completely understandable question. Uh, because unless God explains the connection between that historical event 2,000 years ago and us today, we would certainly fail to see the importance of it. And uh, the good news is that God has explained what Jesus did on the cross has to do with you today. And he explains it very carefully, very precisely, And very clearly in this passage that we just read. And so we have a clear explanation of what the cross means for us. Now, when theologians talk about what the cross means uh, for us today, sometimes they use a very theological term. It's called atonement. And uh, we don't talk about atonement very much, unless, of course, you know, legally someone's done something wrong and they have to atone for their crimes. You know, well, you'll hear about that. And that sort of gives you a little bit of a hint, a little bit of an idea what's going on with, the, with uh, this idea of spiritual atonement. Um, but theologians love to use the word atonement. They love to talk about theories of the atonement. They love to pontificate with one another and um, argue about different theories of the atonement. I had a professor at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary when I was getting my master's degree by the name of Dr. Terry Fields. And it didn't take very long for uh, Dr. Fields to uh, learn my name, even though his class was very large, because I'm just one of those people. And, um, and so I would argue with Dr. Fields, and it was all done in Christian love, uh, but he and I would disagree on a number of points, one of them being this. And Dr. Fields would, uh, he was very famous for teaching all of us preacher boys back in the day, uh, things like this. 
he would say, well, there are many meanings to the death of Christ on the cross. He would say, the cross is like a magnificent diamond. The way it speaks to you depends on how you look at it. And I, I would just think, well, that, that's very touching. That's, that's very beautiful, you know. Uh, makes me want to go to, at, down to Hellsburg Diamonds and just buy a diamond for somebody and, or maybe just look at it for a while. But here's the problem. I have a hard time believing that God has left the determination of what the cross means to us. It seems to me that if God has gone through all of the trouble to reveal himself through Christ and to reveal himself through his word, that he would be silent or even confusing about the singular event that not only reconciles man to himself, but also all of creation to himself. And so I would say to someone who would think like Dr. Fields uh, that, yes, Christ has, through the cross, uh, or I would say the cross of Christ is an example of God's love. Sure, that's true. The cross of Christ is the basis for the undoing of all things that Adam did. That, yes, the cross of Christ does address how God's honor uh, has been offended by our sin, that the cross of Christ does show that sin is displeasing to God. The cross of Christ does show that Christ is victorious over hostile spiritual battles uh, or powers. All of these theories that theologians have come up with over the years, I would say that you know the vast majority of them, there's an element of truth in all of those things, but there's something else that the cross of Christ is. And this something else is primary. This something else is essential to what Jesus did on the cross and what it means to us. And theologians over the centuries have wished to diminish it or ignore it or dispute it. And here's what it is. When Jesus died on the cross, he became our substitute who paid the penalty for our sin in order to reconcile us to God. This is very important. And many theologians don't like this idea. They say it's outdated. They say it makes God to be angry or vengeful. It it makes God take punishment too far. Or they say it makes God look like some type of bloodthirsty ancient deity that requires human sacrifice. And so theologians, many of them like to run away from this. Or they like to at least diminish this idea and just put it in as one of many various theories of what Jesus did on the cross and what it means to us. These theologians are wrong. This understanding of the cross is found in the Scriptures repeatedly, including in our passage today. And if these theologians portray this understanding of the cross in such a way as to demean the nature of God, they do so intentionally in order to sell their books or in order, or simply because they are instruments of Satan. This is a primary understanding of what Jesus did on the cross. And by the way, as Easter approaches here in just a few weeks, You'll see some of these theologians today making appearances on the History Channel or on CNN because to secular outlets such as these, the cross of Christ means little more than advertising dollars in their pocket. But for us, I think we should be like the Bereans of whom it was written in Acts 17, 11, The people here were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica since they received the word with eagerness 
and examine the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And so let us take a more close look at the cross of Christ and how it reconciled us to God. Now, when you and I think about reconciliation, what does that imply? Well, it implies that two parties or two people have been uh, estranged with one another, right? It means that something bad has happened. Something bad has occurred. And it disrupts the harmony. It disrupts the fellowship that two parties should otherwise share. And so once this bad thing happens, then one of the parties or both of the parties become very hostile to the other. They become enemies to one another. To, to one degree or another, they become enemies. They're no longer working toward the same goal, but they're working against each other. And so you think about this in life, and uh, you think about, well, in marriage. In marriage, people can become estranged, can't they? In parent-child relationships, people can become estranged. In friendships, people can become estranged. In work relationships, people can become estranged. And by the way, you know, when I mention these various relationships that may be in your life, if I happen to come across one where some estrangement has happened in your life, uh, it stings a little bit when I mention it, doesn't it? I don't do that intentionally. I don't do that for the purpose of hurting you. But I just want to point it out that when there's that estrangement and someone mentions it, it hurts, doesn't it? Why is that? It's because we're not meant to be people of hostility. We don't want hostility. We don't want to be alienated. We want peace and harmony in life, in all aspects of life, don't we? But somewhere along the way, something went wrong and created this alienation, it created this hostility, it created this estrangement. Now, this sermon is not to tell you how to fix your relationships with other people, but I'll give it to you for free anyway. Listen, listen quickly, okay? If you cause the offense, Jesus said that you need to go and try to make things right. If the other person caused the offense, Jesus said that you need to go and try to make it right. In either case, no matter who caused the offense, Jesus said that the first step must be taken by you. Question, what if the other person won't listen to me? Well, then you've done what you can. Romans 12, 18 says, If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you. Don't claim that verse if you haven't taken a step to try to fix it. Now, let's get back to this idea of being reconciled with God. Because just like in marriage, or in parenting, or friendships, or work relationships, another kind of estrangement has occurred. Humanity has become estranged from God. Now, how did this happen? It happened because of sin. Sin estranged us from God. Sin has broken our fellowship with God. Sin has become a barrier between us and God. Our sin began with Adam and Eve, but it didn't stay there. Sin not only estranged us from God, but it also changed our nature. And because we have inherited a nature inclined towards sin, Adam and Eve are not the only guilty parties. So are we. And so we have rebellious hearts. We have dirty, selfish minds. We say acidic things with our tongue. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 puts it this way. 
Once, that means at one time in the past, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions. That's the way it used to be. That is the state humanity finds itself in. And so if God is going to address this problem that we read about in this verse, it's not just the estrangement that has to be overcome, it's also the sinful nature. You see, back on a human scale, you can make amends with somebody who's estranged from you. Y'all can all kiss and make up and everything's good again. However, if neither of you actually have a change of heart, the same old problems are going to happen again. And unfortunately, I probably stand here in a room full of people that can express that wisdom through hard experiences. Not only must there be the estrangement addressed, but also the heart has to be changed. And so when it comes to us and God, our sins have made us alienated, that's the estrangement. Our sins have made us hostile in our minds, that's rebelliousness. And our sins have made us, uh, ex as expressed in our evil actions, meaning you've done bad things and you've said bad things. And so let's see what God did about reconciling us to himself. In the next verse we read, but now he has reconciled you. Point number one. God is the one who has initiated reconciliation with you. He has reconciled you. Sometimes we talk about, well, I came to God. Or I found God. Well, from a human perspective, I understand what you're saying. But in reality... God is the one who came to you. Whether you recognize it or not, whether you realize it or not, God is the one who initiated this, this reconciliation. You see, your reconciled relationship with God is not something that you came up with. You didn't take the first step. God did. He initiated the reconciliation. He initiated your salvation. And by the way, this is a very good thing because if our reconciliation with God was left to our own devices, it would never, ever happen. We'd never get anywhere. By the way, we should never think that there was some kind of conflict on the part of God between His love and His wrath. Have you ever heard a preacher talk in that way or maybe a Sunday school teacher? I'm not trying to call anyone out because I don't know. Um, but have you ever heard someone, or maybe you've thought this way yourself, or you've put it this way yourself, where you say something like, well, God's anger battled against God's love, and God's love won out. Well, that's a very unfortunate way to put it, and because it's simply not true. There has never been any division in God's character between His wrath and His love. God's love is a righteous love. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that. God's wrath does not battle against His love. His wrath against sin is directed in such a way that He proved His love for us. His wrath and His love work in perfect harmony in order to reconcile us to himself, to accomplish his purposes. I've also heard Christians say things like this. God the Father is angry against sin, but God the Son appeased the Father's anger. The Son turned the Father's hatred into love. Again, this is a mischaracterization of the nature of God. And at the very best, it is an unfortunate and misleading way to talk about what Jesus did on the cross. The idea that God the Father would otherwise hate us is completely untrue. It is God the Father who is the author 
of reconciliation. Another verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Look at what it says. It says, in Christ, God, that's the Father. The Father was reconciling the world to himself. So don't ever let anyone convince you that God is just this mean old vengeful God who's just out to get you, but Christ jumped in and saved your hide from him. No, 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 no. God's not out to get you. It was God the Father who is reconciling you to himself through Christ. And so please don't be, ever be convinced that one member of the Godhead is somehow going up against another member of the Godhead or somehow that there's some conflict between different aspects of God's nature. God is not schizophrenic in any way. Okay, God is perfectly whole. He's perfectly healthy in every way that we could imagine. God is the one who initiated our salvation. And so reconciliation with God is initiated by the love of God. Even though sin has made humanity the enemies of God, God the Father loved his enemies. In fact, here's what God did. And this is, this is an incredible thought. God used the hostility that humanity had for God as a tool that reconciled humanity with God. Think about that. God used our hostility toward Him in such a way that as that hostility was pointed against Christ and put Christ on the cross, God actually affected our reconciliation with Him. When humanity killed the Son of God on a cross, this was a, an act of supreme alienation and hostility toward God. But it was through the cross of Christ that reconciliation with man was achieved. Again in Colossians 1.22, But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death. This was the means by which God reconciled humanity to himself. It was through the death of his son on the cross. You see, when Jesus experienced death on the cross, what happened in the physical realm is obvious. He died. Right? But what happened in the spiritual realm? This is what happened. In the spiritual realm, Jesus Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, He actually became our sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says exactly that. He, that's God, made the one who did not know sin, who was the one who did not know sin? That's Christ. God made Christ to be sin for us. So that in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. When the cross of Christ happened, there was an exchange in the spiritual realm. All of the sinfulness that is a part of us, Jesus took away. He actually and literally became our sin. And when he became our sin, the penalty for sin, which is death, was poured out on him. And he died, paying the penalty for our sin. And the other part of the exchange happened this way. That we, sinners who believe in the Lord Jesus, had all of our sinfulness, all of our guilt, all of our shame taken away from us. And in exchange for Jesus taking our sin, Jesus gave us his righteousness think about that that's the exchange 
That's the deal. That's the contract if you want to sign it. You sign a contract, you pay so much money for a house, right? You're out the money, you get the house. You're out the money, you get the car. That's part of the deal. Well, what's the deal with the cross? Here's the deal in those terms. You're out the sin, you get the righteousness. That's a pretty good deal, if you ask me. And I want you to think about the righteousness of Christ. You see, when Jesus was tempted by the devil three times in the wilderness, he remained righteous. Every prayer that Jesus offered, he gave in righteousness. Every word of truth that Jesus spoke, he said in righteousness. In every action that Jesus took, he acted in righteousness. With every miracle that Jesus performed, he performed that miracle in righteousness. And in every step that Jesus took toward the cross, it was done in righteousness. His step from the, his journey all the way to Jerusalem that week, to the cursing of the fig tree that week was done in righteousness. The cleansing of the temple was done in righteousness. The proclamations against Jerusalem in Matthew 23 was done in righteousness. The Last Supper was given in righteousness. His prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane were given in righteousness. His arrest and his trials before the leaders were done in righteousness. His carrying of his own cross was done in righteousness. The nails piercing his hands and his feet, he was still righteous through all of that. The prayers that he offered while he was on the cross were given in righteousness. To the very giving up of his spirit, all of that was done in perfect and holy righteousness. And all of it, every last bit of it, not only was done in righteousness, but that is what is given to you by the cross. All of Christ's righteousness is given to us. And He takes all of our sin. I'm not going to take time to outline exactly how sinful you are. But it's not a pretty picture. Not for any of us. He took all of our sin and he gave us all of his righteousness. That is what happened on the cross. And that is why we are reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see that exchange in 2 Corinthians 5.21? Our sin for Christ's righteousness. Christ became sin. We become righteous. And because this exchange took place, we are reconciled to God. Question. What are the results of being reconciled to God? I'll just give you a couple of them. One is peace with God. Peace with God is one result of our reconciliation. Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's that mean, peace with God? Well, the peace of God is that, that spiritual sense where you feel pretty good about life, okay? And, and things are just not able to get to you so bad. That's the peace of God. But peace with God is something a little bit different. And it happens before you have the peace of God. Peace with God means this. It means you never again have to worry about God's wrath. That's what that means. It means that you are completely accepted in Christ. That's the peace with God. It means that God's wrath against you has been completely removed. Well, what if I mess up? I said it's been removed. It means that now you are in a good relationship with God. You're no longer in a hostile relationship, an alienated relationship. That's what Paul says you were in past tense. But now you have reconciliation with God, which comes 
with peace with God. A second result of our reconciliation with God is that it offers you the potential for reconciliation between you and people that are estranged from you. There's a lot of things that separate people from one another. But I'll tell you this, if both parties have experienced reconciliation with God, then the barriers that separated them from one another melt away. If you are estranged and alienated from God, or excuse me, from someone right now, I would advise you to take this to heart. Instead of believing in your heart that the main thing that has to happen is I got to get right with that person, think of it this way. The main thing that has to happen is that both of you need to get right with God. And if both parties are right with God, then it opens up a door for being right with one another. Reconciliation with God is your primary need. It's also the other person's primary need. And once that happens, reconciliation among people is much easier. This reconciliation that God has initiated, that God has accomplished through the cross of Christ, it is yours. It is a gift of God to you. However, it comes with a responsibility on your end that we read about very quickly in verse 23. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Listen to me. If, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, why would you ever abandon your faith with all that God has done for you? Why would you ever turn away from God? Why would you ever allow yourself to be so completely distracted that you forget about Christ and all that he has done for you? The enemy of your faith will tempt you to sell your birthright for a bowl of stew that comes in many forms. And I could spend a week of Sundays discussing every counterfeit gospel that's been dreamt up in the mind of man. But in the end, it's very, very simple. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone to provide you with the spiritual help that you need every day. The wisdom, the help, the provisions that God can provide. Look to Christ alone because why? He is sufficient for you.